Thank you very much, Simon. Um, and thank you very much for those very kind words of introduction. Um, thank you very much also to the um, association for asking me to speak uh, this evening. Um, as Simon said, I essentially I'm going to uh, read to you this, this paper, but I hope in a fairly um, helpful kind of way. Sometimes I use, or quite often I use slides, but I chose not to do that on this occasion because there are quite a few strands of the discussion I want to draw together and I want it to, to make sense. What I'm particularly interested to hear uh, is, and this is my element of self-interest, uh, is comments from practitioners and people who have particular views on the view that I'm going to put forward. Um, as I say, I'm very happy to uh, to send the draft to anyone who would like to see it, and I'd be very interested uh, to hear your views. So the title of my talk, it lasts about 25 minutes, so, um, so you know you're not in for the long haul. Uh, but um, uh, my title is Green Taxes in Winter. Green Taxes in Winter, Passing the Policy Explanations. Well, many people here will remember the 1969 movie, The Italian Job, the ending of which is one of the most famous scenes in post-war cinema. The gang's getaway coach is balanced precariously on the edge of a cliff in the Italian Alps. At the back of the stripped-out vehicle is the gold bullion that the gang have stolen. At the other, the gang members themselves all huddled together. They have a seemingly insoluble dilemma. If they move too fast, the coach plunges to oblivion. If they stay where they are, they maintain an equilibrium, albeit an uneasy one. The laws of Newtonian physics are overlaid with the slim possibility of doing something practical to get the coach back on the road. Well, this kind of dilemma easy to explain technically, but requiring almost superhuman practical skills to resolve, is an image of the classical political problem. And it illustrates the kind of dilemma facing policymakers in the environmental arena now in the autumn of 2010. The environmental science, and indeed the economic science, present ever clearer conclusions about both the causes and the effects of environmental problems, most importantly, of course, climate change, as well as the policy tools to mitigate them. Among the latter, which is why we're discussing these topics this evening, are, of course, the so-called economic instruments for environmental regulation, most importantly, environmental or green taxes and transferable pollution permits or emissions allowances. The rationale common to both of these is a microeconomic one. By building externality costs into the prices of environmentally damaging goods and services, it is possible to persuade consumers to choose more environmentally friendly alternatives. Not only this, but as the environmental tax contributors to the Merlis Review the recent comprehensive analysis of the British tax system, point out the benefits thereby produced are generated far more efficiently than would be the case with traditional command and control regulation. In this paper, I propose to urge a particular kind of wisdom in the further development of the green taxation idea. Can I just stop there? Can you raise your hand if you can hear me all right? I should have asked you to be in. That's fine. It's a good idea. I shall not necessarily be comparing and contrasting green taxes and tradable permits. They are different, although in the later case, or the latter case, the market is in effect determining the level of the tax. In keeping with the theme of the evening, however, I shall touch only lightly on the surrounding regulatory frameworks. The paper will unfold in four distinct stages, out of which I hope to build a cautious but practical conclusion. The first part of my discussion is an attempt to capture the nature and consequences of New Labour's green tax project. If the coalition government is to proceed effectively in this policy area, 
a close appreciation of the new Labour approach will be essential. With this background in mind, I then proceed in the second part of the paper to a discussion of the impact on this project of the difficult economic circumstances prevailing since the fall of Lehman Brothers in September 2008. Attentive as you no doubt are, you'll have spotted that this is the significance of the first part of my title. This winter of fiscal stringency makes all of the policy justifications offered in previous times function differently. And I want to try, if I can, to find out how this may be. To this end, in the third part, I pass the justifications for green taxes in this new policy context. And I do so in the light of the three principal policy-making alternatives at this juncture, abolition, retention, and conservation. In the fourth and final part of the paper, I hold out the possibility for a richer debate on green taxes than the one to which we have become accustomed. I seek to generate this possibility both from the understanding of the green tax debate portrayed earlier on and from the contribution, and this is quite interesting, the contribution to this area, not specifically to this area, but to politics generally, of the conservative political philosopher Michael Oakeshott, who died in 1990. OK, then, green taxes as a new labour project. My first main contention is an exhortation to the coalition to engage patiently with the detailed threads of new labour tax policy, green tax policy. Given the radical zeal with which the coalition has approached its first few months in office, this will require an uncommon degree of careful, practical reasoning. Scientific principles, so to speak, by themselves, will not be enough. In line with Oakeshott's thinking, I want to argue that destruction and creation in this area would be far less preferable to some much more careful consolidation and reform. And the approach that I'm suggesting should, for this reason alone, commend itself to conservative-minded members of the coalition whether of a Tory or Liberal Democrat persuasion. Patient engagement with new Labour green tax policy is necessary, in my view, for at least four reasons. One is that all the major new Labour policy documents from 1997 onwards bear the firm imprint of Gordon Brown. The emphasis on the public interest, the constant stress on the relationship between efficiency and fairness, and the resolution of all of these issues into economic analysis. For Conservatives and for Liberal Democrats alike, the Brownian rhetoric, as well as the obsessive attention to detail, is, I hate to say this, very difficult to stomach. But it will have to be done nonetheless. Secondly, such an exercise will be extremely time-consuming. As I know from my own experience, and especially from working on the book with my co-author, Jeremy D'Souza, between 2002 and 2005, the archive of governmental and parliamentary material on green taxes, to say nothing of European, IMF, GAP 1994-WTO, and UN material, is immense. A third reason why patient engagement with new Labour policy in this area will be difficult is that it's still not clear how closely the various government departments relevant to this area, so the Treasury, Environment, Transport and Business, work together. Mark Schofield of PricewaterhouseCoopers, writing on the environmental aspects of the June budget, pointedly referred to the results of a PricewaterhouseCoopers poll which revealed that, quotes, 82% of UK businesses do not believe that government departments collaborate sufficiently. Added to this are the failings uncovered by the Treasury Select Committee on liaison between the Treasury and HM Revenue and Customs, not to mention their findings of low levels of morale in both departments, and the result is not encouraging. It is true that the coalition have taken early steps 
to focus attention on the need to improve tax policy making procedure, but in doing so they have not highlighted green taxes, nor have they particularly emphasised the problems of departmental liaison to which I've just alluded. It does not take much imagination to conceive of some blue sky thinking on green taxes, especially around budget time, wreaking terrible havoc with the complicated system that the coalition has inherited. That the green tax system we have is complicated goes almost without saying. But I would like to highlight one aspect of that complication which I envisage being overlooked. This is the structure of the exemptions and reliefs within the climate change levy code. The levy being the highly complex tax on the non-charitable, non-domestic consumption of coal and gas generated electricity. When the tax was introduced in 2000, there was much concern about the stability of exemptions for combined heat and power, CHB, and indeed considerable anxiety early on over their scope. The wider review of the tax system currently on foot under the auspices of the Coalition's Office for Tax Simplification, under John Whiting, is in the process of evaluating the plethora of exemptions and reliefs built into the system under the new Labour government. Although the office has not so far placed emphasis on green taxes, I for one am very concerned about the vulnerability of such exemptions and reliefs, especially given the fact that demand for electricity is, as they say, inelastic, and the need for sources of government income is ever more pressing. My concerns are not naive ones. Rather than the complete abolition of such exemptions and reliefs, I could envisage instead incursions on their scope, which is fairly generous, and the introduction of further anti-avoidance provisions. I give CHP as an example because it's a classic illustration of how maintaining confidence in private sector investment decisions is so necessary to green taxes. Yet perhaps I should be more concerned about the environmental dimension to the non-environmental taxes, the so-called tax subsidies. The coalition, as my friend Nick Maltby observed to me, has been vividly illustrate, as has been vividly illustrated over the last few days, seems to have done quite enough already to shake confidence in the, among the private sector. And fiddling about with these would erode confidence still further. The treatment of CHP is indeed a detailed thread of new Labour green tax policy, and I shall return to my concern over these detailed threads in a moment. For the present, I would reiterate my contention that detailed engagement, patient engagement, with what exists already is an essential prerequisite to taking green tax policy forward. So in the light of these various factors, I would take a slightly different view of the situation from that, it's a different but respectful view of the situation from that expressed by Mr. Schofield. He concluded his budget analysis, which I referred to above, with the comment that, quotes, UK business will expect substantial progress on green tax policy design before the end of the year. Indeed, and this is me again, it may well be that the pressure for change gathers momentum in the coming months. What I would say is that it's actually rather encouraging that the coalition has settled for the promise of two consultations at this stage on a proposal for a per plane aviation tax as well as on the recalibration of the climate change levy towards a greater connection with environmental harm for which the tax base is a proxy. If the coalition's approach to environmental taxes is proving a cautious one, this is because in events in September 2008 have put a new perspective on the various justifications for such taxes. In essence, these judgments were originally about economic efficiency. While not occluding considerations of tax fairness, these latter were not always at the top of the agenda. In the wealth of the literature on this, the externality that the green tax is designed to correct 
is characterized simply as a market failure. Before turning to the issues involved in choosing between the policy alternatives available now in the autumn of 2010, I'd like to unpack this justification in a little more detail in the light of recent events. When New Labour was propelled to power in 1997, the background was an economy of strong economic growth and a clear mandate to reorient the tax system away from the taxation of, quotes, goods, unquotes, as Sir Crispin Tickell had memorably put it in a report for John Major's government, and towards the taxation of bads. The next four years saw the introduction of two big new environmental taxes, as well as a plethora of associated economic instruments, including a domestic emissions trading scheme, which for a while ran alongside its very different and much bigger European counterpart. Over a slightly longer time scale, we saw environmentally friendly components built into the existing tax codes on fuel duties and vehicle excise duty, as well as into the income tax and corporation tax codes. The two big new environmental taxes were climate change levy, to which I've already referred, and aggregates levy, a tax on the commercial exploitation of primary aggregates, for example, gravel. At the same time, landfill tax, which had been originally introduced in 1995, in the dying days of John Major's administration, was given a new lease of life by being linked via the revenues that it raised to various worthwhile community initiatives. Of course, neither the benign economic circumstances of 1997 nor a specific environmental tax mandate, so to speak, prevailed in the 2010 general election. One feature of green tax policy, a powerful one, even in 1997, does however remain. This is the factor that to the extent that green taxes are indirect taxes on com commodities and services, they are inherently unfair. In 1997, it was possible to disguise this fact by applying them almost exclusively to supplies to businesses. Today, in 2010, even that seems no longer possible. Economic circumstances have pushed the economic justification for environmental taxes, market failure, into the background and focused attention instead on their regressive or unfair nature. This will be the effect of the increase in the rate of VAT, obviously not an environmental tax, from January next year. And it may be that this looming problem has figured prominently in the coalition's current stance to leave green taxes more or less well alone for now. In shifting attention from efficiency to fairness, current economic circumstances have illustrated the limits of government. And I'm indebted to the conversation with Nick Maltby again for that particular insight. Such limits might easily be overlooked, especially by a new government assessing the role of economic analysis in green tax policy making. Another such limit tackles the efficiency value on which so much weight was originally placed. One of the arguments invariably made against green taxes is that the choice they assume is illusory. There are usually no realistic alternatives to at least certain levels of the consumption of the particular good or service that is environmentally harmful. What this, like the fairness issue, illustrates is the need for policymakers to move in a truly scientific manner, not, for example, to treat the Merleys review, admirable though it is, as a technical, technical blueprint, but merely as a gathering of data to inform practical political decisions. So portraying the unfairness problems of the green tax taxation as a major block on their further development, and at least under certain circumstances, brings me back to the filmic image with which I began. It leads me to build into the discussion at this point a consideration of what the relationship may be between the political reality, to coin a phrase, and the scientific, that is, the environmental and economic justifications for green taxes. I want to consider this relationship in the light of three possibilities, namely complete repeal of New Labour's green tax system, its complete preservation, and finally, its judicious adjustment. I shall concentrate on the first of these, 
Since, as you'll infer, have inferred, I favour judicious adjustment, and a complete preservation of the new Labour regime does not seem to me to be a likely outcome. The first possibility, of course, but brutally, is simply to abolish all of the three main green taxes introduced or remodelled under new Labour. If Mr Schofield is right, there's an unrivaled opportunity now to undertake some such process of destruction, as well as the opportunity to create something nicer instead. Mr Schofield says that, quotes, the new government is close to a clean slate as it will ever get, and quotes the Engineering Employers Federation, the EEF, as saying, quotes, that an overall of climate overhaul of climate policy is indeed needed to provide clear, transparent, simple, reliable and targeted investment, sorry, incentives to decarbonise. Setting aside the EEF's vigorous opposition to the introduction of the climate change levy, it has to be conceded that the arguments in favour of complete abolition are stronger than they might at first appear. First, green taxes impose costs, often unfair ones, as I've said, in the sense that they are regressive. Just now, more than ever, all businesses want to cut costs. Secondly, which is a less business-oriented argument, whereas the green tax ide ideology of New Labour as embodied in the 1997 election commitments and set out in detail in a 2002 policy document requires such taxes, there's no specific coalition pledge that requires them to be maintained. Thirdly, stripping out green taxes entirely from the system as taxes that are intended to influ influence behaviour would be consistent with the coalition's pledge to scale back and simplify the tax system. These points made, however, the arguments against outright abolition seem on balance stronger. First, the cost to individuals and to businesses of the taxes themselves reflects in principle a societal cost. That is their justification after all, well documented in Stern and elsewhere. Exonerating businesses from these costs would smack of placing sectoral interests ahead of the national interest that the coalition professes to embody. Secondly, although there is no coalition pledge requiring the maintenance of New Labour's environmental taxes, other outside pressures may in fact produce the same effect. The targets imposed by the landfill directive were one of the factors that led to the reinvigoration of this conservative-inspired tax, and these obviously remain following the May 2010 general election. Furthermore, despite the failure of countries to achieve global agreement on climate change in Copenhagen last December, both European and, more importantly, domestic emissions targets remain stringent. And so I'm conscious of the fact that time is moving on now, so essentially what I'm just going to say is I briefly then go on to refer to the fact that the uh, coalition has got these two consultations going on modifying climate change levy and also uh, air pass replacing air passenger duty with a new aviation duty uh, on a per plane basis. I just want to pass very quickly, if I may, to a number of reasons why I mentioned earlier on uh, the idea that uh, Michael Oakeshott's view or his thinking may uh, offer some help in knowing where to move forward. Um, I should stress that I'm not necessarily aligning myself with Oakeshott's thought. I'm not, by, by temperament, quite a conservative. However, as uh, Martin Lachlan has forcefully reminded all public lawyers, Oakeshott is important, even absent the change in the political circumstances. And essentially, I say that there are four reasons for this. Um, first of all, what Oakeshott says is that scientific arguments by themselves are not a good basis for policy. Policy has to be based on careful judgments about what to do next. And First of all, what I suggest he says about this particular area and what we do about the new Labour inheritance is that he suggests that we need to handle practically what we have now rather than building more uh, technical material on top of it. Secondly, um, I think he provides a good uh, basis, I think Oakeshott provides a good basis for seeing how these taxes might operate in the, consequent, in the context of the big society that David Cameron envisages. Thirdly, um, I suggest that it enables us also to see these taxes for what they are, which is essentially this neoliberal economic instrument. And fourthly, um, I want to emphasize a point which maybe is a little bit surprising, which is that to the extent that Oakeshott says that we should make policy decisions based on the contribution of people who work with 
uh, the material that we're looking at. Um, we have a role to play as environmental lawyers, as environmental ec economists, and enormous expertise has been developed in this area, which we shouldn't just junk. Okay, by way of conclusion then, I've, I hope that's reasonably coherent. I can elaborate a little on that in questions, but I, I don't want to overrun. Just very briefly, if you're one of those who remember the movie to which I referred to at the beginning, you remember that with a coach perched on the cliff, the gang leader's exhortation, this is Charlie Croker's, exhortation to his mates is, hang on a minute, lads, I've got a great idea. Uh, much of the policy making that so far emerged from the coalition, as, seem, as it seems to me from my modest perspective, has this quality about it. What I'm saying instead is this. Although our current green taxes are a product of new labour political economy, and although the current economic situation is not auspicious, the green tax regime that was created, I think, should be maintained and conserved, modified possibly but sensitively, against the possibility of a more wide-ranging green tax debate in the medium to long term. So what we could think about it, and I put it no higher than this, are points such as the following. First, the value and at the same time the limitations of the extreme technicality of New Labour's approach. Secondly, New Labour's prudence in not underestimating the regressive impact of green taxes, even at a time when the economy was apparently strong. Thirdly, the undesirability of junking the wealth of experience that the current system embodies. And finally, the important contribution which we as public lawyers would have to make to an approach that valued patient engagement with what exists already over bold innovation. Hang on a minute, lads and lasses, I've got a great idea. Could not possibly, could it, embody an approach to the true science of government? Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much indeed, John. Um, I'm sure many of you will have questions for John, but we'll take those at the end. Uh, moving now on to our second last speaker, uh, Will Everson. Uh, Will is uh, an environmental economist um, at currently at PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, and he is uh, the chapter editor of a report that's sometimes referred to um, as the Stern Report for Biodiversity, but to give it its full name, uh, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, or T for short, Report for Business. Um, so, without further ado, I'll pass over to, to Will. And I think you've got slides, Will, haven't you? Do you want to move down? I do. Over there. I think Will just moved so we can see your slides, if that's OK. All right. Everyone hear me OK? Yes. Good day. Uh, thanks, Simon. Thanks very much, Dr. Snape, for a fascinating, very eloquent and precise uh, talk. I, I hope uh, what I lack in eloquence and precision I can make up for in part with some nice pictures and <laughs> charts on my, on my slides. Uh, I wonder if this clicker is going to work. There we go. Um, Quick, quick, quick sort of introduction to start with. Thank you, Simon, for that. I, as Simon said, I'm an environmental economist at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, I sit in a team called Sustainability and Climate Change. We have about uh, 100 people in the UK working on various aspects of sustainability with corporates, with uh, policymakers, with uh, NGOs, um, and about 700 people around the world working on the same kinds of issues. Um, and I work in a small part of that team mostly environmental economists, some foresters and ecologists in a team we call Forestry and Ecosystems. Um, and over the past year or so, I spent a lot of my time working with an international group of academics, policymakers, business people on this report, which Simon mentioned, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity. I should say this study, because it's more than a on the report. Um, more on that in a minute, but I, I like to do a sort of bit of market research. Who in the room before today had heard of TEEB, the economics of ecosystems? And fantastic. So I think that's the strongest response I've ever got. <laughs> uh, I think uh, clearly the message is getting out there a little bit, at least. Um, 
So today I wanted to just whip through, I think I've got about 30 minutes, Simon said. I'll do a bit of an intro to Teeb for those who haven't heard of it or don't know a bit of the backstory. Quickly on a couple of terms so that we're all on the, on the same page. Um, a bit about the kind of core issue that, that Teeb tries to deal with, this recognizing the value of nature. Um, I'll, uh, rather than going into great detail on the Teeb report for policymakers, I'll just pick, I've, I've picked a couple of my favorite examples from that report. So I'll run through a couple of those and hopefully that'll cover some of the key concepts. Something that really interests me then, the, the kind of growing, something I've noticed working in this field for a number of years now, there's a bit of growing concern amongst businesses, amongst decision makers, about the economic costs of biodiversity loss, of ecosystem degradation. So I'll just highlight that and then go on to talk again, just a couple of examples from the TEAB report for business. Uh, and then rather grandly at the end, I've said a new landscape for decisions, really, uh, you know, where does this leave us? I try to try to wrap it up. I'm going to grab a water. Mm. Simon, if you could tell me when I'm at 20 minutes or so. I don't have a, have a watch, I'm afraid. Um, so Teeb kicked off in... Uh, ah, thanks very much. Kicked off in uh, 2007 at a meeting of the G8 plus 5 environment ministers. Originally called the Potsdam Initiative for Biological Diversity. And if you can read the, the text, I won't read it out, but... Uh, it, it hopefully spells out the fact that this was the stern report for biodiversity. That was the idea. Look at the costs of, uh, the, the value of what we have, the costs of losing it, versus the costs of conserving ecosystems and biodiversity. So the goals of TEAB, uh, demonstrate the value of what we have, what we risk losing, underline the urgency of action, the benefits of that action, show how the value of ecosystem services can be assessed, where it can be helpful, uh, look at how we can take it into account in decision making, identify those solutions and sources of support, and crucially address the needs of the user groups. So bringing that together, the, uh, the policy makers, local administrators, businesses and citizens. And that's how we get to the five TEAB reports of phase two of this big T study. Uh, so five reports, in which I was involved in one, there are perhaps 500 plus authors, uh, editors, reviewers in this whole, whole process. They've got a report at the top which picks up the ecological and economic foundations for T, and then through the user groups, a report for policymakers, report for local uh, administrators really, which was released actually a couple of weeks ago. Um, a report for business, uh, which came out a couple of months ago at the Global Business and Biodiversity Symposium. And then, hopefully not a report actually, but a, a mechanism for communicating this to consumers, to, to, to citizens, to the public, which will probably be in the form of uh, some kind of website and social networking exercise. They're working on that for the end of the year. Now, I said I'm not going to go into these in detail because I sometimes am asked to talk through the TEAB report and spend you know, an hour and a half on that in itself. So you can pick up those reports at teabweb.org if you want, or if you haven't already read them. I hope you haven't, because then <laughs> I won't have much to say. So starting with a few of these sort of terms that I'll be banging around just so that we, we're all on the same page. The vaguely scientific side of things, biodiversity is the variety within and between species, genes and ecosystems. And I suppose just important here not to think about purely birds and bugs and bees and flowers, but rather this kind of holistic concept. Uh, I'll, I'll say more on that in a second. Um, an ecosystem, a dynamic complex of plants, animals and microorganisms. Uh, these might be uh, wilderness areas like uh, they might be areas of open ocean or they might be managed ecosystems like farms or urban ecosystems and then ecosystem services uh, and this is a, a new one to a lot of people also often called 
uh, environmental services or natural services. And put simply, these are the benefits that people, that businesses get from nature. Uh, often, these are things that we receive for free. So there are a few examples on the slide. Fresh water, timber, pollination services, climate regulation increasingly being recognized as, as valuable. Um, but also genetic resources, protection from natural hazards, recreation. These are all things that the natural environment gives us, has always given us. Um, ecosystem service is not a new concept, but it was sort of formally recognized in something called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which uh, the early part of this, uh, this decade. So again, so everyone's clear that really all we're talking about here is the natural world, nature, uh, if we're talking about stocks of in, in ecosystems, stands of trees or fish and, and all this uh, uh, biodiversity that we call it, we, you know, people often describe that as natural capital, akin to financial capital and human capital, physical capital of businesses. And then ecosystem services, also called, like I said, environmental services, natural services, services also called renewable natural resources, so to distinguish them from oil and coal and iron ore, non-renewable ones. So I'll say a little bit about a core issue that Teeb seeks to address, which is that decision makers recognize the value of nature. Uh, Stern put out some pretty scary numbers about the impact, uh, the costs of climate change. Um, and what we did here to, to give a comparable number was say, taking 2008 greenhouse gas emissions at Stern's social cost of carbon, what's the cost of those 2008 emissions? It comes out at just under $2 trillion per year. Um, and a lot of people have now come to recognize that climate change is a, is a serious issue. Uh, the number which came out of one of the um, scoping studies for the TEAB report for the, the annual cost of loss of biodiversity and degradation of ecosystems, well, you can see that the two numbers are in the same kind of ballpark. And that's the only point I'd make here. These numbers aren't, certainly aren't directly comparable. They overlap a fair bit. They're generated in, in different ways, but hopefully makes the point that the, the loss of uh, biodiversity, the degradation of ecosystems is an issue which has a serious environmental, uh, a, a serious economic rather, cost, which we bear as a society. Sorry, something slightly odd's gone on with the slides, but hopefully you can read these. Um, so I talked a bit about the the multiple benefits of ecosystems, e ecosystem services. So a, a list, a sort of synopsis of them down the side in categories which the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment set out. And my point here is just that we get many of these ecosystem services from a single resort. This chart on the right just shows estimates of the value of seven of those ecosystem services provided by wetlands. So a wetland habitat. Um, and you'll see on the chart the value of, of uh, wetlands as a mitigator of extreme weather, or of extreme uh, events. They also treat our waste, and clearly that has a value. If we, uh, if we lose that wetland, then we need to replace that waste treatment facility. But similarly, down into a plethora of other uh, ecosystem services. So thinking for a second, well, how aware are we at the moment of ecosystem value in the kind of decisions that we take? I think with provisioning services, with the, with the perhaps the obvious ones, maybe you could call them ecosystem goods, uh, food, fiber, fuel, logs, fish. Uh, these, these ecosystem services have market values. They're generally known, we take them into account and businesses do, policymakers do. Whether those prices are right is a, a whole different question, but they at least are priced. Water provision, genetic resources, getting into some of the, the other provisioning services. Historically, 
their value has been overlooked. Now, there are some exceptions with pharma companies, for example, in the private sector who put a value on genetic resources, but generally speaking, often overlooked. Climate regulation. The, 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 the service that the natural environment delivers in, delivers in terms of regulating the, both the global climate and the local climate, managing precipitation, evaporation. Long ignored, but increasingly, I think, being understood, and there's now a price of carbon in markets, and there's a social cost of carbon which has been estimated by, by many different people, including, including Stern. Water and waste purification, I think it, these are values which are often overlooked, the, the value of uh, those, those services that we get from nature. And you could say the same about erosion control, natural hazard mitigation. Often we only recognize the value of these services that the environment provides once they're, once they're lost. Once the mangrove forest that was protecting a coastal area in Southeast Asia is gone, we realize the damage that is wreaked by a storm, but we didn't necessarily recognize that in advance. And then cultural services, things like uh, aesthetic benefit, uh, recreation, tourism. You know, tourism operators essentially sell the value of the environment and rely on it. Uh, now, often these values are implicit in markets. They're implicit in the cost of your holiday. They might be implicit in the cost of your home if you live near a beautiful lake. But they're rarely uh, openly calculated, fully recognized. Oh, yeah. So generally we can say decision making is biased towards the short term economic benefits and the long term value of ecosystem services is poorly understood and little recognised. So that in a, in a nutshell is the reason behind T, behind an economic approach to the value of nature. The purpose of the reports then is to distill that information which is which is gathered in particularly in the underpinning report T deliverable zero on the scientific ecological economic underpinnings of T to still that and present it for user groups like policymakers like businesses and help them to make decisions on that basis so uh, well that is the, the T report for policymakers in a nutshell. But I won't go through it, like I said, I'll, I'll just uh, crack on with a couple of my favorite examples from T, which I think illustrate the point, the, 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 the underlying concepts fairly well. So if we take the common conversion decision in, uh, in Southeast Asia. And this, this particular study relates to South Thailand. Common decision to convert a area of mangrove, coastal mangrove forest into a prawn farm, shrimp farm as they, they might call it. Uh, if we look at, at, at that decision on the basis of just purely the private profits from those two land uses, so prawn farm is the light green bar and mangrove forest, the little dark green bar. We look at the private profits from a prawn farm, nearly 10,000 US dollars per hectare per year. And if we look at the private profits from a mangrove forest, well, this is you know, really the local community gathering some firewood, uh, food and other non-timber forest products, being able to sell them or use them. So they have value, but it's, it's relatively limited on that comparison. But it turns out that a great deal of that private profit to a prawn farm is actually made up of public subsidy. It's a, a, a capacity enhancing subsidy from the government of Thailand to shrimp farmers, prawn farmers. If we take that public subsidy out and just compare private profits, less subsidies to the private profits, it's, it's a less clear decision. It's a less clear cut Right, we'll convert everything to prawn farms. Now then, then, it turns out, I don't know how well you guys know prawn farming, but I've learned a bit about it recently. 
It turns out that after about five years, five to seven years, you can no longer farm prawns anymore. The area is simply too degraded. And then there's a big public cost to restore that ecosystem back to a, a viable state. Now, if you take that public cost, allocate it over the five years or seven years, what you end up with is that actually converting an area to a prawn farm has a negative return a negative overall return. And if you add to the private profit of a mangrove forest, you add the value of a, just a couple of the ecosystem services that we talked about before. So mangrove forests perform an important service as a, as a fish nursery for valuable offshore fish stocks. Get rid of the mangrove, get rid of the offshore fish stock. And they also, as we mentioned, perform a valuable service preventing or, or protecting the coastline from, from storms. Now, if you add those uh, public benefits, the value of those ecosystem services, you get a pretty starkly different con conversion decision. You're faced with a pretty starkly different uh, set of information. So this is, this is part of what TEEB is trying to do. It's trying to shed light on these somewhat bizarre decisions that are taken at the moment. Another of my favorite examples. Does, does anyone, anyone care to hazard a guess what that shows? What it is? Fishing locations. Next to a no fish tank. Exactly right. Have you read the TEAB report? <laughs> Gee. Uh, it is, it's, a, it's a marine protected area off the um, New England coast uh, it's, I mean technically it's a, a, a no take zone rather I should say now before the no take zone was instituted the, uh, the fishermen in, in, in the area um, lo well, initially lobbied against it uh, they said it would destroy their livelihood. It would, you know, put them out of business. Um, this is the the situation. Uh, I, don't quote me on this, but five, eight, perhaps years after the institution of the no take zone, and these the dots on the on the screen show the location of the fish and catches. And if you can see the colours, they show the, the sort of weight of the catch from those areas, all tracked via GPS, which is also how the fishermen know where they can fish and where they can't. Now, I don't know about you, but I would say that you know, fishermen know where the fishing is good, and it seems to be in the immediate vicinity of the marine protected area. And essentially what's happening is, of course, there's a big increase in fish biomass in the marine protected area, and then that's spilling over, and the fishermen, the same fishermen essentially who lobbied against this are taking full advantage. And now 73% is the stat of the U.S. haddock catch is, is taken within five kilometers of that marine protected area. Now, what this really brings to light for me is that you, you recognize the value, you need to recognize the value over a long period of time uh, delivered by ecosystem services, in this case, you know, fish biomass production. But is the overall catch greater, the same or less than it was before the no, the no fish zone was instituted? The overall catch per year, I don't know. Whatever. But the overall catch uh, over time, much greater because... The fishermen caught more fish. Over, over a period of time. Over a period of time. So not necessarily, you know, the year... Well, in fact, I think the year before it was instituted, there was yes, a pretty dramatic a year, drop off in fish catch, and for that reason, yeah. it got the go-ahead. But yeah, over a period of years, far greater because they're now no longer yeah. degrading it unsustainably. A couple of examples from, from T for policymakers. Now, uh, like I said, I, I, I work a lot with with corporates, and I, I've noticed this in, in conversations with them, but also it's backed up by a few 
uh, papers which I'll mention that this growing level of concern amongst decision makers about the loss of biodiversity, about the costs of ecosystem degradation. I point to a report by the World Economic Forum. Uh, each year they publish um, this right. They publish the uh, yeah the, the global risk report. It's called. And they publish this at, at, at Davos every year, uh, and it's based on a survey of experts from academia, from business, from NGOs, from governments about their perception of a series of global risks. Now, uh, on this chart, it did, this just shows the movement in concern about biodiversity loss between 2009 and 2010, which in the context of this is actually uh, a fairly big move, um, but, and, and an increase, but clearly in the context of various other risks that these same experts rate, it, it doesn't look uh, necessarily all that significant. A second piece of the puzzle from the WEF report, interpret that one, if you will. Uh, the, the other thing that the, the World Economic Forum asks people about is the relationship between categories of risks. They're very interested in the systemic nature of, of risk. And, and what they found in 2010 was an acute upsurge in the people's perception of the systemic nature of the loss of biodiversity and the, the, the degradation of ecosystems. They found, in fact, that biodiversity loss was the second, perhaps, or third most interconnected category of risk. And when you look at some of the, I don't know if you can even read it, but, but some of the risks that it's heavily connected to, um, which are you know, also rated as some of the most severe risks facing the, the planet, you get, a, you get a picture that people are increasingly concerned about biodiversity loss. Now, we also, uh, PwC does a survey every year where we ask uh, over a thousand CEOs uh, about a whole range of issues. Uh, this year it focused a lot on the economic downturn, but we also ask a question about, or, or a, a number of questions about climate change, about biodiversity loss, about uh, environmental degradation. And this year there was a particular uptick in the perception of biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation as a threat to business growth. Now this is the, the answer to that question split by the, the countries. Now, <laughs> I find some interesting, uh, I, 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 don't know, I don't know whether you call them insights, but it, it's fascinating to me that CEOs in Latin America and Africa are far more concerned about biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation, and we could, we could spend all night wondering why that is, and that people in North America and Central and Eastern Europe aren't in the least bit bothered. Uh, but that's my, my backdrop for businesses being somewhat more concerned. So, T for business. That's the outline of T for business. Again, we can talk at great length about all the detail of it, but I won't. Um, but that's the, the themes that the report picks up. And I, again, I've drawn a couple of my favorite examples from the report, which emphasize some of the issues that a business is grappling with in this in this area. So the first example looks at the impact of business on ecosystems and the costs, uh, the economic costs of those impacts. So we all, it, it concerns uh, deforestation in China. We all recognize that forests provide great value, provide uh, many services on which businesses and society depends. And this, this study, this, this piece of work for Teeb looked at the impact of the demand of the construction industry on forests uh, and the costs, the economic costs of that demand. Now from the 19th, this is based on a number of academic studies, I've just got one of the references on the slide but I could, could give the others as well. Um, from the, from the 1950s to the end of the 
uh, end of the century, China dramatically reduced its, its forest cover. It exploited its forests. Uh, and, and the majority of that went into the construction industry. Now, all this uh, impacted on, on key ecosystem services. Watershed protection, soil conservation were acutely compromised. And this uh, degradation reached a kind of tipping point in 1997 when there was... Uh, I just want to get the numbers right, but a severe drought in, in, uh, in, in China, and, and, and those droughts caused the lower reaches of the Yellow River to dry up entirely for two-thirds of the year, threatening industrial production, agricultural production, uh, and obviously residential water users as well. And then in 1998, the reverse happened. There was massive flooding in China. Almost all the major river basins were affected, it devastated big areas. Thousands of lives were lost. Um, upwards of $30 billion of, of damage was done in 1998 prices. Now, this chap, uh, uh, Chinese economist Wang Hongchang, did a study to estimate the cost of deforestation in China um, by separately looking at the value of the ecosystem services lost with some of those ecosystem services we talked about before. He looked at climate regulation, timber, food, water regulation, erosion prevention. And this, um, this chart on the right shows the breakdown of what he calculated as the per annum costs of this loss as a result of deforestation. He estimated that the total annual cost was about, excuse me, about 12 billion about $12 billion, and that's broken down, as you see on the right-hand chart. So the blue bar shows the relative costs for the loss of each of these ecosystem services, and the green bar shows the market price for timber. Now, we won't go into the details of the costs of the loss of those ecosystem services, but a fairly stark point, I think, is that the market price doesn't even come close to covering the external environmental cost imposed by deforestation. And if it were to, we'd see a pretty dramatic realignment in the market price of, of timber. Now the other example I've drawn from the, the T for Business report is about the dependency of one industry on ecosystems. In this case I've looked at, at blueberries in Michigan. The, uh, the blueberry crop in, in Michigan is worth about $124 million a year. It's part of um, circa $1 billion of revenue from other fruits and nuts. And all of these are heavily reliant on animal pollinators. Uh, now, at present, um, or in fact until recently, I should say, this should be updated, um, local producers were paying for managed hives at a cost of about one and a half million dollars a year. Now these hives are uh, under threat, in fact they were impacted by what, what's called colony collapse disorder, uh, which is a somewhat ill understood uh, phenomenon affecting beehives all around the world. And what they, what they recognised is that the, the natural backstop provided by natural pollinators had been lost um, and that this, this value had also been lost. So in, in 2009 Syngenta, the big uh, agribusiness, um, launched something it called Operation Pollinator and the aim of that uh, exercise was to restore the native habitat of pollinators. Now they did that in Michigan, they're actually doing it uh, across the USA, across parts of the EU and that is driven by a recognition that the value of natural pollination services and uh, as a means for pollinating crops, that is a more cost-effective way of doing it than paying for uh, artificial pollination. Now there have been somewhat talked about examples in, in China more recently where the loss of pollinators is so dramatic that um, apple trees and cherry trees are being pollinated by hand by people with paintbrushes. 
that's a, a sort of replacement of a you know extreme example of what happens when you lose an ecosystem service and you need to replace it with some other kind of solution. So to wrap up, I talked a lot about um, uh, natural capital and the way that the decisions we're taking at the moment uh, erode our natural capital. Hopefully that that message has come across. Now, the dark green line here shows us kind of schematic representation of that path that we're on, eroding natural capital. And the light green line at the top is, you know, a classic utopian alternative pathway that we might get to if we you know, institute some sensible solutions like uh, good environmental tax reform that Dr. Snape talked about. So how do we get onto that uh, higher path? Well, partly it's going to be about investing in green infrastructure, about restoring degraded ecosystems, and about investing in a proper protected area network. And partly it's about measures which individuals can take on, like uh, reducing meat consumption. Um, it's about leveraging markets, uh, about leveraging environmental certification. It's about GPP, sorry for the acronym, which is uh, Green Public Procurement, which can be a very powerful driver of, uh, of change. It's about in innovation in agriculture. It's also about more broadly getting the economic signals right. Um, a whole collection of acronyms, which are payments for ecosystem services. So the idea that stewards of natural resources can be paid for that stewardship. Um, so they don't purely have to be paid to exploit natural resources. Uh, RED stands for reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. This is a concept which is being talked, at, talked about extensively at a UN level uh, for paying uh, payments for standing forests, payments for avoiding deforestation. So there's an alternative to levelling tropical rainforests and ranching cattle. Uh, access and benefit sharing is about, essentially about uh, appropriately sharing the re rewards, the value of ecosystems. It's clearly it's about what Dr. Snape talked about. There's, there's a, you know, a key role for environmental taxation in here for charges. There's a huge importance for subsidy reform. Uh, you know, effort enhancing subsidies like those affecting uh, fisheries are, you know, are frankly ludicrous in many cases. <laughs> and clearly this is all about better regulation, it's, about, uh, it's also about better governance. And what we've got here is a, is a mixture of policy solutions, voluntary measures, business responses, things that individuals can do. I suppose the point that I'd end on is that this hopefully shows is that we have the tools to do something about the natural capital path that we're on. Uh, we, we just need to recognize the value of nature. Well, TBD0 and lots of other economic literature provides us with the, the means to recognize that. And then we need to understand how to reflect that economic value in the economic incentive structures that we have all around us. Uh, well, that's the purpose of some of the other TIB reports, the purpose of lots of other work that's going on at the moment. Uh, and then, you know, potentially we move to this sort of better path where we're restoring our natural capital and, and protecting it. Thanks very much. very much um, both uh, John and Will for two absolutely superb um, papers and pre presentations. Um, it, it, it just seemed to me that you couldn't do more important work than uh, Will is doing with his colleagues at T you know, in, in, in assessing this um, so that he has information that can be given to policy, policy makers 
to show them what the true value uh, of, of the environment is, and, you know, and if we don't factor that in and we carry on with the externalities that, that is present, that, that in the long run is going to cost us all um, a, a great deal in, in every respect, and not just in financial terms. Uh, and, and then along to, to John and the work that he's doing uh, to, to help, you know, to help shape um, taxation and economic incentives so that we can have you know, a system which does properly reflect the, you know, the, true, uh, the true value of the environment. So um, thank you very much, both of you, for these extremely important um, presentations. Um, can we please take questions? We've got at least 20 minutes to take questions from the audience. Thank you, yes. Yes, I thought Will's explanation was very useful indeed. Yeah. Everything you said. I'm sitting here, my first grandchild was born four months ago, and I'm thinking about taxation and fuel protests and that sort of thing, and I'm thinking I have a vote, but my unborn grandchildren don't have a vote. In our democratic societies, and indeed in our managed uh, economies, do we have the bottle really to address the sort of issues that William has raised? And the only thing that's given me grounds for optimism now from what I've heard is that BWC think it worthwhile having a large number of William Evansons ever since I've bought. I hope it's a growing <laughs> number because that indicates people are addressing the problem. But I, I must say I'm optimistic about this. But I have a degree of pessimism about green taxes. Shall I, sh I step in? Please place? do. Yeah. Um, just to pick up on the um, on the green tax tax aspect of that, and I'll, I'll hand over to uh, to Will. Um, the it isn't a good moment, this, for environmental taxes. It's difficult to imagine a point where the issues could have been more difficult. Um, and something that is a source of concern to me, I'm not quite sure what, the, what, what a, a plausible view on this is, but if you go back to 1997, when there was a tremendous uh, momentum, obviously talking about this country now, in relation to green taxes, uh, and the economy was doing well, even then it was still very difficult to introduce measures which relied on an almost um, textbook, so to speak, um, economic analysis of the problems. And one of the big problems was, this, as I mentioned in the talk, was the difficulty with the regressivity of environmental taxes. Um, the idea that the very thing that you are trying to do to dissuade people from making certain choices is a thing about which they have no choice and in relation to which there will be a bigger dent uh, in bigger proportionate dent in, their, in, in the income of poorer people than in the income of richer people. And I should mention to the, if you're interested in this area folks, um, the Merlis Review, which I mentioned, uh, uh, which uh, was published earlier on this year, contains an extremely full, it's called Dimensions of Tax Design, contains a very full discussion of all the economic issues surrounding this. And they actually elaborate on this problem of, of uh, the distributional problem caused by regressivity very helpfully. They outline all the issues. But I agree it is not a, an optimistic time. Mm. Well, I don't know if you want to do. Uh, one small piece of optimism. You'll be pleased to hear that our team is growing. Um, I, I find it fascinating. Uh, I think one of the issues you touched on is, uh, you know, the fact that your unborn grandchild doesn't have a, uh, you know, it doesn't have a vote. This kind of question of the in intergenerational distribution of benefits the way that uh, I mean this is a, 
at its heart a question of the way that we discount the future and uh, the way that businesses discount the future is, is certainly not intergenerational in fact it's very short term often um, they use a very high discount rate governments are in a position to use a, a much lower discount rate but even then you know, some would argue that a positive discount rate at all so effectively placing a higher value on the benefit that we get over the next 30, 40 years versus the benefit that future generations get is you know, morally unacceptable. It's a question that Teeb tries to tackle, um, but it's a, it's a very challenging area. Uh, it's a, another very good question, especially in these straightened times. Um, there's a, 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 at Copenhagen, um, some money that's called the Fast Start Funding was pledged for um, climate change adaptation. That was about $30 billion. Uh, so governments at the moment have got that money to spend, but it's frankly probably a drop in the ocean. I, if I could just pick up on, on one example of how uh, there's a hope that money will flow in the future, though, to the protection of, of natural assets. I mentioned um, reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. It's being discussed at a, at a UN level, and this is the idea that people could be paid to, to protect forests rather than cut them down. Now, the idea, or one idea, is to link that to the compliance carbon markets. So markets like the market for, for CO2 in Europe. Now, that market is worth upwards of $100, uh, $100 billion every year. So there's a big base of firms acting under what we call the polluter pays principle being required to buy carbon credits and if that if some of that money could be channeled towards protecting forests well all to the good so that's one potential avenue i suppose um though on the example you gave well of the, of the, the mangoes um you don't need money i mean it's just a question of I mean, as you say the uh, the subsidy was used in the wrong way so it's yeah. a question of the, the right allocation of the money. It wasn't a shortage of money, just making sure it's, it's used the correct rather than the wrong purposes. Exactly right. I mean, there are other the, the challenges, there are other economic issues at play aside from purely the ones I outlined. But you're exactly right. I mean, in that situation, it's just a perverse decision and there's not a need for more funding per no. se, mm -hmm. just for a, a better decision-making framework yeah. in the first place. Um, ask you about, about green taxes, which is so many, how many would um, how many would relate them to uh, commodity price volatility. The very obvious example is the price of oil, which in the sort of 2008 was around 150 billion yeah, yeah. pound. Now that's 78. And now that, you like that in the price of petrol, just to take one rather simple. No, no, that's example, a very good example. Very, yeah. very Um, this, uh, thanks very much, this is a very, yeah, it's, it's no, no, it's a very good question. Um, I should perhaps just very briefly mention, if I, if I can, are you thinking that there was quite a bit of debate in Parliament on this last year at the time of the 2009 Finance Bill? And um, I, I'm, I'm saying this because I'm not sure there is an easy answer to this, because the, the issue was raised by the then, I think he was at that point, the Shadow Economic Secretary to the Treasury, I'm not absolutely sure, David Gork, who is now the current uh, Exchequer Secretary to the Treasury. 
And he, I wrote a note about this actually in the, in the BTR, British Tax Review, and he raised this question in conjunction with the Liberal Democrats who for one reason or another um, were in some contention um, with him. But there was, there was certainly a uh, perception that um, petrol price volatility but also at an even more um, fundamental level, the very idea that there is an environmental um, uh, tax element to excise duties on fuel um, impacting disproportionately on people, for example, in rural areas who had distances to travel and therefore lots of petrol to buy. Uh, and one of the questions which, um, I mean, there's a, there's a very rich strand here, so I don't want to go. I don't want to go on too too long. I think the short answer is it, it's very. It is extremely difficult to know what to do about that. It's possible that you could devise a very smart mechanism. Um, in a way, the Labour government did try to do that. Uh, everyone who's familiar with the, um, but they did it the other way under a di under a different set of economic circumstances. They came up with something called a fuel duty escalator, which was designed to keep the uh, the um, the tax level, which they thought should apply to um, the use of petrol, at a, at a realistic level over years, over time, so that pe so this was a kind. Of, this was the other way around. It just shows you how circumstances change. I mean, I mean, what you could do, for example, is just try to sustain the price at a certain level. So if it's now the price of barrel oil is kind of low, or yeah, two years yeah, ago, then increase the consumption uh, consumption tax, yeah, push the price up. But if the underlying no it's, it's uh, I, I'm, I don't know what the answer to that is it's, no, I don't, but I, then I don't think anyone else does either I mean it's I, a very tricky question I mean I suppose if I could comment on that yeah. you then get into a sort of risk of misallocation of resources yeah. you know if the if the price of oil is being driven by fundamentals which should cause people to adjust their behaviour then you know, artificially maintaining it at a specific level might cause, uh, you know, would cause economic inefficiency. I, th I think that's my problem with it in a sense because it is in a sense the I mean, there are various problems. I have a more fundamental problem, which is this, again, the regressivity thing, which has got nothing to do with the volatility. That's just, a, you know, that's, a, that's a, a, that is, if you like, a logically prior question. But, um, yeah, I would agree. That, 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 that it, it, that's kind of striking at the root of the kind of market-oriented nature of this type of policy making. But it's not a very good question. By the way, I'm sorry about the air conditioning. If, if I knew how to turn it off, I, I would. But I think if I start switching things off that perhaps shouldn't be mm -hmm. switched off, I might cause even more problems, so no thanks. I'd like to fundamentally disagree with the previous point. If you compare the UK with a high level of fuel duty, which of course is a, a, a per unit rather than percentage, yeah. with America, where there's very low taxation of fuel, you'll see that in fact that the volatility of the fuel price in the UK is much less much less than in the US because we have this high duty as opposed to a low tax on yeah. fuel. So yeah. I think it's a good example of where an, ec an ecological charge tax can be helpful not just in achieving an aim but also in reducing volatility. And another issue on the fuel duty aspect, I think it was introduced by the Tories and then repealed by Labour in 2000 with fuel protests. No, it was actually introduced by Labour but then they had to backtrack. Mm. Uh, and that does seem to sit strangely with your overall point about this green tax thing being a, a, a Labour uh, project. I've got another kind of point for the biodiversity and the point the gentleman front made about how we kind of get future generations interested in household. The Climate Change Act is a way of locking in our future kind of action on part of even now with the recession. Uh, normally you expect the government to kind of abandon 
have the, the environmental argument, because we have a combined targets for the future, they can't do that. I mean, if they want to abolish the 2008 Act, they still have to abolish the government, they need to ask that to the Parliament. So I'd like to ask Mr. Phelps, is there a way we have some sort of biodiversity loss act working out kind of a nice metric of biodiversity budgets every five years? Uh, it might be a risk that if we focus on metrics, we will miss out some of the things that are valued. And finally, I'm very touched by Mr. Boyle's introduction about profit deposits. I'm from the campaign for temporary relief. You might have heard uh, Bill Bryson launching our uh, research, Have You Got the Bottle? It's a very uh, interesting question. I mean, at the heart of it, um, you know, really whether to have a natural capital act, basically. Um, yeah, at the heart of it is the issue that it's very difficult to measure uh, where you're at with natural capital. And no one does that particularly effectively at a kind of holistic level. So there are a myriad of indicators uh, and many combined indicators, but no one is quite happy with any of those. But if you put that aside, um, I mean, I've heard various murmurings from both sides of the house, well, all three sides, no, just the two sides now, about this idea of putting in place a natural capital act to, to mirror, in some degree, the Climate Change Act. But I don't know where that's got to. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I mean, from my perspective, it would be an excellent idea. I also think there's a big need to push uh, national green accounting up the agenda, which is part of the same, you know, part and parcel of the same issue. And getting, you know, beyond GDP, which is, you know, a, you know, a long-held bugbear of many people in the environmental economic space. Can, can, I, can I just very briefly come back on the, on the comment from over there? Um, two things, just first of all. Um, I don't... I, the points you make are perfectly valid ones, and, and there is a particular reason why they're valid, which I'll raise in a second. Um, I think what I, the essential point I'm making is this, uh, we, I, I, and I think it's quite an important one, um, that the, um, I'm, I'm not saying that you, if you go further back, you can't find, I mean, the landfill tax, obviously, as I think I mentioned, was actually a Tory initiative. You know, the, this is not, it isn't a party political point. I think the only thing I'm saying is that the, the, the huge panoply of green tax material that now exists is bound predominantly to have come from that 13-year period. And I think what I'm saying is that rather than, and, and this seems to me to be just so important, really, really important, rather than just starting with a, key, a clean slate. And I, I don't want... I mentioned Mark Schofield and his use of that expression. I, I don't want to, to suggest that he's, you know, suggesting that we start from zero. Um, but but I, I'd quite like to get away from this idea that there's nothing there that couldn't... You know, that there isn't substantial work there that couldn't just be built on and improved rather than, uh, than you know, just started again from. However, I've just checked my own article on this point <laughs> on the question of the introduction of the original fuel duty escalator, and you are right. It was introduced in 1993 under the Tories. It was repealed in 1999 by the Labour government, who then introduced another one. It, yeah, sorry, my recollection was just letting me down. But it doesn't affect the, jet, the overall point, which is the one which I stick with, which is this, um, the idea that although very closely bound up in new Labour initiatives, I think we should really patiently engage with what happened for the sake of, apart from anything else, of not alienating business from it. You know. Right, gosh, we've still got a lot of hands up for questions. Almost everybody mm. wanted to, to have a question. Gentleman at the back in blue shirt, can you see? Yeah, is there a sort of, money for us, I suppose, is, is there a sufficient body of scientific and economic evidence to give a kind of a, a robust defence of biodiversity, mm -hmm. for example, in the case of is there enough evidence to show that, say, uh, ancient woodland in our country is 
that much more valuable in terms of the existing services than, say, coniferous plantation. To actually, and to sort of, so taking away the cultural values, which obviously are very large in different countries, but just assuming that nobody cared about it, is there enough just purely on your provisioning services and your regulatory services to actually show objectively, so to speak, that it's worthwhile protecting biodiversity? Or could you simply change the land use from a very low or say virgin landscape or a non-intensively managed landscape to a much more intensive landscape and use the land? Uh, it's an interesting but difficult question to answer. I mean, I suppose a lot of the value wrapped up in ancient, in our ancient woodlands, is cultural and recreational value. Um, they do provide other ecosystem services, but and I'm not I'm not close to the literature to know those values, but I know and you know. A, great volume of studies have been done in the UK on the value of woodland um, but whether it's enough to make a sustained case I don't know There's all sorts of difference between some of the, for example rainforest is untouched as opposed to a managed plantation of timber is there enough difference between most two land, uh, land uses to actually justify keeping the, the opportunity for us not logging the timber so you can still manage it on a more or less sustainable Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, m massively so in most cases, yeah. Uh, I mean, Teeb has made various estimates of the value uh, based on what economists call meta-analysis, so bringing together many studies on the value of uh, intact rainforest. Um, and they, they put that at you know, a hugely higher figure than the private returns you would get from a, you know, if you leveled that for cattle ranching or for a plantation. So yes, in that case, the, the, the case is very strong. Uh, the reality though is that, as any environmental economist will tell you, that it's, it's that kind of valuation study is inherently location specific. So there will be there will be uh, you know, cases one way or another but at an aggregate level yeah, the, the, the value of old growth forest is demonstrably high Would it be fair to say Will that we can't even cost it properly because we just I mean, we don't know all the species we've only just sort of barely scratched the, the, how many species are in the rainforest so I mean, we, we may, you, you may come up with a figure but we don't know what we're losing so Yeah, yeah, I mean absolutely these are all estimates and different aspects that you value when you value a rainforest are, you know, you could value a myriad different aspects. One of those aspects is, for example, the, the kind of genetic material tied up in species that we've, that we, that we don't even know, uh, that, that, that we, that are unknown to science. Now we've, we value that using a kind of option value theory, so what, what might it be worth, but again that's hugely uh, you know, there's a huge amount of conjecture in there, and and generally speaking, that that kind of value uh, in the calculations doesn't doesn't come out as as, as significant as other sources of ecosystem value. Mm. Um, okay, I'll take your question. Thanks. Uh, I hope so. Um, I hope it's had some successes and it's continuing too. I mean, the, by the very nature of it, it's a very diffuse study. So I suppose to point to very specific concrete examples is difficult, although I'm sure someone in the T team is compiling a, hopefully an extensive compendium of those kind of success stories. Um, but in the sense that I, it's it's that policymakers are act actively engaged in it, and that some of the policymakers, uh, some of the international policymakers, who will be out in the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Conference of the Parties in Nagoya, are debating some of the very central concepts which Teeb has has put forward. 
uh, then yeah, I'd say it's fair to say that it's having an impact and needs to have more. You just take one or two. We may not have time. I don't think we have time for every single question. I'm really uh, sorry about that. Um, I've got a question for, for John. Mm. You um, dwelt rightly, I thought, on mm. the pro- political problems around the regressivity of green taxation. Mm. Um, I wondered if you felt if there was a germ uh, of uh, an answer to that when you look at the um, social profile of the victims of the environmental damage. I mean, certainly yeah. in climate change, it's very well documented that yeah. the people who suffer most are the poorest. Yeah. And there's also plenty of research connected to social deprivation with, yeah. with uh, the worst environmental damage. Do you think there's any traction in that? Can I say thank you very much for that question? That's a very, yeah, I mean, this is, this is the next stage of the debate, it seems to me. And the reason I mentioned Michael Oakeshott in Connect, he, he wasn't just kind of plucked, so to speak, out of the void. The, the reason I mentioned him was because he is um, probably, well, closest in spirit, I suspect, because of the absence of an ideology to the to the, the spirit of, 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 of the coalition's general um, approach to politics. And one thing which, um, the reason why this is relevant to this question is that it might be that uh, educating people about this in the short to medium term, because, I mean, it's a very, very important point. The question is, what do you do with this information? How do you... It isn't as cynical as being, well, you know, how do you present it? What kind of, of spin do you put on it? Because we know what happens with stuff like that. But, but making people more aware and trying to use the scientific... Sorry, trying to use the technical evidence in a kind of scientific and informed way to, to make people more aware of the kind of point that you've mentioned seems to me to be the way forward. It seems to me to be essential to do that before we take this to the next stage. But I suspect that the completely unrelated question of, of VAT and its increase will kind of um, step in and, and may do a lot of damage to that kind of argument in the meantime. But it, yeah, brilliant question. Excellent, thank you. I think we'll just take one more question, but w- what I would say, if we... If we if I can't, if you can't hear your questions, please stay towards the end. I ho- hopefully our speakers will stay on for a, for a drink for and, sh- and, and then sure. the yeah. opportunity yeah, for while, still yeah. to, to um, yeah. edit that level. Yeah. Sorry, I, I can't quite, I couldn't quite catch that. I think the question was, will the Environmental Liability Directive play an important role in this? Can it play an important part? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely, and it already is. Um, so, uh, good examples are, are the way in which it, it, it is um, encouraging uh, environmental offsets. Um, so, uh, and, and I think the broadening of habitat banking and offsetting, which will probably stem or is already stemming from the Environmental Liabilities Directive, is one of the big ways in which it will have a very practical impact on the natural environment. Has the report dealt with this? It, it is, um, yeah, it's, it's picked up as a... A strong policy example in the policy in the uh, in the in the report for policymakers. Yeah. Yeah. No, not so, not so. Well, I think what we'll do now, then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll wrap up the, the sort of formal part of the evening. But please do stay on. Go next door and and uh, and drinks are kindly provided by by Herbert Smith. So further opportunity to talk to our to our speakers. Uh, yeah. sorry. sorry, can I just mention yeah. one thing? Uh, I may be flattering myself about this, but if you're interested to see a copy of the text of what I've said, could you email me and I'll very happily send it to you. The reason I mention that is because, the reason I, can I'm just, just yeah, suggesting we put it on the website is that um, you know, ultimately I'd like to publish it and sometimes publishers are a little bit sensitive about how widely something has been circulated. So if you, you email me, I'd be delighted to send it to you. I mean, the alternative is 
um, we could email it to everybody who's who's come along tonight. Possibly, I'm not sure. I'm no. I'm just concerned about yeah. you know whether a prospective publisher would raise that issue. Uh, okay. I just don't know. I don't. Okay. Know. Well, if um, and if you um, don't have um, John's email, then I- I- if you email Angela, um, who's email address you will have Angela Pallet here at Herbert Smith well just just google me on Warwick yeah. website oh ok yeah. fine yeah. Um, well many many thanks to, to, to both our speakers both as you agree excellent thank, thank you very much for your thank you. Um, this is actually my last appearance in, in chairing uh, a, a London meeting which I've been doing actually since 2003 I thought it was probably time to stop and hand over to, to somebody else um, but I would like to say a very big thanks to Herbert Smith uh, for the, the extremely professional way in, in, which, in which they host this, uh, and especially to, to Angela Pallet, who puts in a huge amount of, of work. Unfortunately, uh, Angela couldn't make it here this evening, um, and I'm certainly looking forward to keep coming along to, to these events, which are, are always superb. But thank you very much, for speak, especially, and for you to coming along. Thank you very much, Thank you. Um, there's a bottle of wine, a couple of